Good morning. How's everybody doing? Um, I, I'm here. It's nine o'clock. Well, it's a little bit after nine o'clock and it's Tuesday, September 8th. Hope you guys are doing good. Um, this, we are like, California is in trouble right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. There are so many fires. Um, the sky has been like red. Um, yeah, it's crazy. There, there, I looked at some numbers. There's over 25 major wildfires right now in California and it's literally just like going up in smoke. Um, yeah, we've had pretty bad air and it's not too bad today, but, um, yeah, if you guys Think about California, man, keep us in your prayers because we are struggling. There are fires, Northern California, San Francisco, Fresno, Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Bernardino, LA, lots of LA, three or four major fires in LA, San Bernardino, San Diego. Um, there are not any in our county, thank goodness but we are sure getting the smoke from everywhere else. So that's what's going on here in California. Um, you know, there was a number of like 1.8 million acres have already burned in California this year, and we still have four months to go. And honestly, this is the, the worst four months of the year, um, September, October, November, December, not so much, but yeah, this is when we get really, really bad. So. Anyway, we're we're all hanging in there, but um, thinking about all the firefighters and um, people that are losing their homes and just getting trapped places, and um, so yeah, that's California. Mm. Um, going on this week in the Lee House, um, we are celebrating a 21st anniversary on Friday, so we're kind of gearing up for that. Um, we were, um, oh, I just got somebody that said, how are the other actors in California? From what I hear, everyone's fine. Um, you can keep Charlotte in your prayers. I know there is a fire up towards Napa. So I, everything I've heard, she's okay. Um, Alice and Bob are doing fine. Um, you know, so we're all, you know, we're all okay. Yeah. As far as I've heard, we're all doing good as of right now. <laughs> so thank you so much. But um, yeah, so we are celebrating an anniversary this Friday. And you know, last year um, at this time, we're actually getting ready to go to Croatia. And it was our big 20. And we don't do big trips, you know, only every five years because we got to save up for those, you know. But um we were trying to figure out if we were going to do something this year, maybe go camping or, um, you know, my husband wanted to, um, rent one of those, um, what's it called? Sprinter vans and just go and do something. And nothing is, well, first of all, there's like no campgrounds available because everything's at like 50% occupancy. And now we got fires all over the state, so smokies, you don't, it's not the year. And so instead of doing that, we decided that we were going to um, rip up our, our downstairs bathroom floor and put in a new floor. And my kids were like, why would you do that? Why would you do that for your anniversary? <laughs> so... You know, some years are really fun and relaxing, and some years you just want to, like, do a project. So that's what we're gearing up for um, for this weekend, and I don't know. I'm kind of excited. It'll be great. So he's taking the day off work, and so we're just going to hang out and maybe go for a hike or go out to brunch and then get all the stuff and work on it all weekend. So, so yeah, so that's what's happening, and um, that's you know, some years are like that, you know, some years there are, um, just times when you celebrate in big ways and sometimes you celebrate in strange ways. So <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, 
And you know, sometimes you're on like this epic trip and you totally like get these memories and these stories forever and that's amazing. And sometimes you're home working on bathroom floor and you have funny stories too. <laughs> and you know, sometimes I think that life's just about like the stories that we live and the stories that we get to tell. And so um, that is interesting because it heads just right into what we're talking about today in chapter one of A Prairie Devotional. Here we go, Prairie Devotional. We made it through the intro last week. If you missed it, go back and watch the video. Um, and the first chapter is called Become a Storyteller. And this is from the episode, it's season six, episode 11, author, author. And you remember this episode, um, Carolyn's mother and father were planning to come to visit them on the banks of Plum Creek. And on the way, Carolyn's mother actually passes away. And so her father comes and is um, very sad and trying to get through his grief and staying with them. It seems like he's staying with them for months and months and months. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hold on a second. But um, he basically, I'll tell you that <clears throat> becoming a storyteller for Grandpa Holbrook basically saved his life, I think. So this is about him and the encouragement to become a storyteller. Here we go. You better get some more paper then. Your grandpa's got a whole lifetime of stories in his head. And Carolyn Ingle says this about his father. And you know, I think when I think about that, we all have a whole lifetime of stories in our heads. And sometimes it takes a tragedy or um, something really hard for us to actually unlock those stories that get trapped inside of us and maybe just because we um, don't have the confidence to share them and then something happens where we go wait a second these are really really important and I mean you guys know me I mean that totally was my brain surgery and like all of a sudden I was like I have something to say like I have something to share, have stories to share. And so that was like my confidence to start doing it. But all right, so here we go. How we live our lives determines what kind of story we can tell. Every day we choose to dive deep into life or watch it pass by. We can live an epic life without visiting exotic places or having extravagant experiences. We just need to engage in the epicness of our own backyards and anywhere our feet might tread. When we live with this attitude, stories emerge, stories we can't help but share. When Carolyn's mother passes away, her grieving father loses the will to live. He resolves to wait passively and watch his life end until Albert asks about his childhood. A story erupts from his brittle soul and he becomes a passionate storyteller of his past. Like Grandpa Holbrook, my grandmother lost her spouse after 47 years of marriage. Grandma Lou was a storyteller when we were growing up. I remember the famous childhood tale of life on her family farm in Minnesota, hunting down a chicken with an ax. And then her expression when she told us how the headless chicken chased her around the barnyard. She said killing Sunday dinner was the worst of all chores. I must have heard that story a hundred times or more. <laughs> After my grandfather died, Grandma Lou kept right on living. Her adventures and memories only became more epic. Not because the experiences were grand, but because every day captivated her. Every visit became a spillway of new stories, moments when she chose to fully live. The opportunities she embraced were transformed into more exciting encounters to share with us. I encourage you to experience and share the extraordinary life God's given you. What kind of story are you living? Is it a life worth retelling? 
take the plunge, don't spectate, participate, and then share what happens. When Grandpa Holbrook started telling stories, he was inspired to keep living. Writing his memoir gave him a bounce in his step and a sparkle in his eyes. All it took was one story to breathe new life into him. Live your life in a way that your stories will be told a hundred times over. And in Joel 1.3 it says, Tell your children about it in the years to come, and let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. And then there's a couple questions. And it says, are you more likely to experience the day and see it as an adventure or sit and watch from the sidelines? How can you engage in the opportunities God puts in front of you? And I'll say that sometimes I find myself sitting on the sidelines and just watching and not jumping into the present moment. And I'll tell you that most of the time, I always regret it. I always think I should have just gone and jumped in the ocean with my kids or I, I should have, um, I should have just put what I wanted to do into action instead of watching, you know what I mean? And so I just encourage you to, uh, go for it, you know, like take the plunge, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because last week we talked about my grandmother, um, about her house and about that picture that was in their bedroom of Michael Landon with Brenda and I. And you'll get another little glimpse here of my grandmother, um, Grandma Lou. So yes, I'm named after her. And I've got a few questions like, why do you have two last names? And um, uh, why don't you use your stage name and all that stuff? So um, I don't use Wendy Turnbaugh. And the reason is because I'm not Wendy Turnbaugh anymore. And I haven't been Wendy Turnbaugh since I was about nine years old. So, um, I've had a lot of last names and I'd like to just claim the one that I have now. Um, Turnbaugh is not always the easiest name for me to claim just with my past, with my, um, with my biological father. And so, that's the reason. Um, also, these stories are about me as a person now, not when I was on Little House, even though I have memories of Little House. And so that's why I use the last name Lee. And it's because that's like who I am. I like to claim my husband's last name. And I decided to put Lou into my um, author name because there are like 4 million <laughs> Wendy Lees, but there are like no Wendy Lou Lee's and um and my grandmother I you notice I talk about her a lot and I totally take after her she was a storyteller and I don't think I was a storyteller until I realized how much I had in common with her and I'll tell you that um that story of my grandmother on the farm when she used to talk to us when we were little and we would ask her every time she'd come to our house. I remember we say, Graham, tell us about the time when you would cut off the chicken's head. Like, tell us about the farm, you know? And so she would tell us and we would just like every time just laugh. And the way she said it, she'd stand up and it's like she was on a stage telling the story. It's just hilarious. Um, she had this other story that's really interesting. So she was the youngest of 11 children and on the farm, you know, all the kids kind of took care of the kids. Her oldest sister was 18 years old when she was born. And so her mom didn't really take care of her. She just kind of followed all the rest of the kids. And there was a day when, um, she actually got into serious trouble. She, uh, was watching her brothers do something with a uh, a pump of some sort and she decided to stick her hand in this pump and basically ripped off one of her fingers <laughs> she's like three years old and it was her um, index finger of her left hand I believe so um, very very interesting that she rips off her finger and the old country doctor, she tells a story, this old country doctor actually, she, she cut it, it cut off about right there, but the old country doctor decided to cut the finger down like this so that it would almost look like the curve of the natural curve. 
And so it, you almost couldn't tell that she didn't have that finger. And so we would tell this story all the time and she would like tease us. She would say, count your fingers. And we'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then she would say, count my fingers. And she would always start with the hand with five fingers. And we'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> And it was like this, such this funny joke. And so I just remember being a kid and hearing that story over and over and over and over again. And I remember telling that story. I remember being at a softball game and dragging my mom, uh, my grandmother with me and playing that same trick on another kid that was seven years old. And I think sometimes we, we are more confident to tell other people's stories than our own. Like I just remember telling those stories about my grandmother, what my grandmother told me so many times before I had the confidence to tell my own stories. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if you're like that. You know what I mean? But um, there was there. Okay. I'll tell you a story of my, uh, this is when I was little, but this is my kid's favorite story of that. I have been telling them. Okay. So, well, actually there's two lake stories I can tell. All right. And you can get a little glimpse of how silly I was as a kid, but, um, so I'm probably about seven, seven or eight years old. And, um, one day we were at the roller skating rink and we're all putting on our roller skates. We used to go roller skating all the time because my mom was a big roller skater. And so we would go roller skating like, I don't know, once, once or twice a month at least. Um, and so we're all putting our roller skates on. And of course I got my roller skates down on faster than everyone else, I guess. And I am roller skating with, you know, when you kind of crouch down, almost like you're, um, you're on your skates, but you're crouched down into a little ball and you're just like, okay, that's what I was doing. And I bonked, I, you know, those big, I don't know if you guys remember roller skates yet, yeah, roller skating rinks, but they had those big, long, like square, almost like tables, but they were really low. So you could sit on them. And I was fooling around and I roller skated right into the corner of one of those tables. Okay, so I bust open my chin and I ended up spending the rest of the night at the roller skating rink. You know how the roller skating rink is at the bottom? And then there is <laughs> the people that play the music, they're kind of like up above in like this sound room with this glass wall and you can see down at the, okay. I got to spend the rest of the night up there with them with an ice pack on my chin because, bless my mom's heart, she was going to miss out on her roller skating. And so I kept an ice pack on my chin, hung out with the, with the owners or whoever the music people were, the DJ at the roller skating rink. And then when the roller skating night was over, we went and got my chin sketched up. Is that hilarious? Okay, so we get my chin totally stitched up. I've got like, I don't know how many stitches in the bottom of my chin. And then, <clears throat> I don't know, it's a couple weeks later, I get my stitches out. Okay, I get the stitches out. And the next day, or the day after, whatever, we, we go to the lake. Okay, and if you guys have read my book, you know I have like lake stories. Um, we like grew up going to the lake and... Um, <clears throat> Anyway, so we're at the lake and I don't know if you know, like if you're on like a houseboat and then you have like a ski boat kind of pulled on the side of it, it's kind of like tied to the side. And there's like, you know, when you get into the steep ski boat, there's kind of like a little, a little space where you have to like step over. There's the lake, you know? Okay. So I'm about, you know, seven or eight. And I'm just like a crazy little girl. And I decide that it would be really fun to jump back and forth between the boat and the houseboat. And, you know, over this little crack of the waters down there. <laughs> and 
I've just had my stitches just out. And so, of course, what happens is I end up falling in between and hitting my chin in the exact same spot on the little metal corner <laughs> of the houseboat. And I end up going back to the emergency room and getting more stitches in my chin. And then I get to not go in the water for the rest of the week, you know, so that's me. And I still have that scar on my chin really, really far down there. Anyway, so there's my one leg story. The kids love to hear that story because I'm just like this crazy little kid who has no self-control and they love hearing that. So there's one. I'll tell you another one. This one was, we were also on the houseboat and we were on the, usually we would go to the houseboat. This was my grandparents' houseboat up in um, Oroville, California, which is Northern California. And we would go up there for a couple of weeks usually. Well, this one year we're there and everything is going wrong. Like it is so hot and all of the boats end up just breaking. Okay. So the houseboat actually has this, the engine. And when we got there, the engine was not working at all. And so they, they had parked the houseboat in a cove and we couldn't even move it. Um, so I think they actually even took the engine out so they could work on the engine while we were there. So we we're just stuck forever in this one spot, which was totally fine because you know, it's a lake. We don't need to move, but then the ski boat breaks. And so I have this, like we have this picture in my mind from my mother's um, scrapbook of that week. And my dad and one of my dad's friends, cause his family was there too sitting in the ski boat with the engine cover up, just like, oh my gosh, we're never going to fix this boat. So anyway, so that was, um, that summer and we ended up leaving the, the lake like a week early because everything was broken and we, we couldn't, you know, do the fun stuff on the lake or whatever. And it was so hot anyway. So we leave and we're driving back. We, we still lived in Southern California at that point. And we were driving down from Northern California. And my dad said, you know what, let's stop off at this other lake where he had a, um, like a pontoon boat and this other ski boat that him and his brother and a friend kind of all shared. And they said, let's just stop off. And we'll just, it was the day after 4th of July. Let's just stop off. We'll, we'll cool off and um, go for a little ski ride and then we'll jump out the car and go home. And so we were like, yay, let's do it. You know, cause like you're driving on the I-5 and it's like 110 degrees and you're like, oh, anyway. So, so we get there, we're so excited. <clears throat> we like just grab our stuff and we, we run down the dock and we jump in the boat and my dad just like starts up the boat and um, we get out, we get past the five mile hour zone, you know, five mile hour wake, the no wake zone. And he turns the engine off and he's like, who's going first? <laughs> and I'm like, me, me, me. And so I jump in the water and I could not ski, okay? I was the only one who couldn't ski because I don't know why I just couldn't do it. And so I had this big round, we called it the disc. Okay. It was a big round piece of plywood that my dad had fiberglass and painted pink and it had my name on it, Wendy on, on the front. Okay. So I jump in the water with my disc ready to have a ride. Okay. So we get in, I'm all ready. And the boat won't start. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? It's just like nothing. And so my dad's like, what could go wrong, right? And so he opens up the engine cover and lo and behold, there's no battery in the boat. Okay, so I don't know how this is possible, but I guess that there was enough juice in the line to get us out, but not to get us back. 
<laughs> so it's the day after 4th of July and back then 4th of July is a zoo but the day after 4th of July nobody on the lake it is just nobody and so we um, we have to swim the boat in so it's my mom my stepdad my older sister Michelle Brenda me and then Heidi is about oh my goodness she's probably three years old and the dog and Charlie the dog <laughs> he's a little black cocker spaniel okay so we're all in the boat and we have to swim this thing in and so basically Heidi and Charlie stayed in the boat and we've got ski ropes hooked to the front and we are kicking and paddling all the way in <laughs> and the funniest thing is is that when <clears throat> right before we got to the lake I remember my stepdad saying okay if anything goes wrong we're going to Magic Mountain on the way home and we were like okay but we thought nothing's gonna go wrong you know and so that kept us swimming because we were like hey we get to go to Magic Mountain and we had never been to Magic Mountain before and so we got done we pulled that boat out of the water actually we just swam it back to the dock and um, I guess what happened was um, my uncle had been there on 4th of July weekend and they were having trouble with the battery and so they just took the battery with them to replace it or to charge it or something and didn't tell my dad but because we were up up at the other at the houseboat there was no reason to so anyway you know miscommunications always <clears throat> turn into the best stories and we then got our trip to Magic Mountain for the first time and there is a couple stories those are my kids favorite stories and they tell them they try to tell them and they go mama mom you tell them better you tell it you tell it because you tell it better um, <clears throat> anyway so that <laughs> is a little glimpse into my crazy um, childhood of silly accidents and um, lake trips so yeah but I guess the moral of the story is like what are what are the stories that you're passing down to the next generation what are the you know most of the stories I think that make the best stories are the things when something goes wrong <laughs> right or maybe um, just something when you learn something when you're just like wow I can't believe that this happened and that's what I learned you know or whatever um, anyway I think that we make a real shift when all of a sudden we can go from telling other people's stories to telling our own stories with like courage and like those stories aren't anything that special that I just told like you guys think they're funny because I'm telling them with such enthusiasm and really maybe that's okay like it's not really about that the story was that epic but like to me it was like I totally remember that like it was one of the funnest things ever to be swimming this boat in and then to get to tell all my friends about our crazy adventure on the lake you know what I mean so anyway pretty fun so my encouragement to you is start telling your own stories tell other people's stories too yes 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 but get to the point where you have the courage to tell your own stories and you know you can write it down you can say it out loud um, just don't let the stories die and that is the encouragement um, I think sometimes we might wait too long oh, I've got low power mode on my phone oh don't worry I'm okay for now we might wait too long and then regret not starting to tell our stories sooner so you know a lot of people wait until they're 70 years old and then they say I'm gonna start writing my stories down you know I've learned that we don't have we don't have the guarantee of another day um, we got to tell our stories when we have a chance so um, yeah write them down say them out loud tell your family whatever don't let your stories die so 
anyway, and your stories matter. They do. You know, I think for so long, I didn't think my story mattered and your stories matter. So I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, I'm going to have a great day. It's a little, uh, hazy and smoky here, but we're okay. And, um, I will see you next week. And thanks so much for joining me for story time. Okay. Bye.